Revelation is where we are. We've been looking at the Word of God. We've been looking at the story of God from the beginning of time, before time. And we've looked at how he created all things. We looked at how he created man and how man made the choice to rule and govern for himself. And in doing so, sin entered the world and the world became a place of death. And as a result, God made a promise to Eve, the first woman, that from her own body would come a Savior that would set things right, that would restore things. And we followed for centuries the promise of that Savior throughout Scripture until we came to a child being born in Bethlehem, Jesus, and the fulfillment of that promise And Jesus provided redemption through living a perfect life, going to a cross, dying for our sin, and then going to a grave, rising from that grave to conquer death. Having defeated both death and sin, he then returned to be with the Father, ascended to heaven, promising he would come again uh, and restore his earth, all of creation, his kingdom here. So we followed that thread through. In the meantime... From his departure to his return, he started what he called his church. And he made disciples, 12 disciples who then made disciples, who made disciples, who made disciples, who gathered to worship, and that became the church. That's who we are today. We followed that thread all the way through. 2,000 years later, we're still doing that, anticipating his coming again. So that brought us to the book that closes out the word of God and the story of God, which is Revelation. I said it last week. It's not Revelations plural. It is revelation. It is not a collection of crazy wild stories about end times, although those things are in there. It is a revealing of Jesus. There's no part in the book of Revelation that should not be pointing you towards who Jesus is and Jesus' return. All right? So it's all about him It's not about all the little details that we necessarily get caught on, although those things are epically important. So, I am also not, really quickly, we've got a couple more we'll do in Revelation. I'm also not, at this time, going through Revelation. So, I know there's a bunch of things in here that are wild and fanciful. We'll look at some today. Uh, But... And you can go back and listen to it. I've got There's a podcast if you want to go listen to it. I've studied it before and taught it if you really want to dig in deep on it. Or you can ask me later. But right now, we're following the story of God. So that's what we're looking for. All right? Last week, John, John who wrote Revelation, saw Jesus for the first time since he'd left. And he looked quite different. We talked about that last week. So this week... Things are a little bit different. This week, I'm calling this seeing God because this week, although John saw Jesus last week and you could say he saw God there, certainly this week things change. God appeared before John on the island where John was. This week, John is going to get invited to stand before God where God is. And it's a whole different scenario. And what you're going to hear today may seem like a fantasy novel. But hopefully it will blow your mind with excitement. Hopefully it will fill your heart with like wonder and joy and anticipation. And I can tell you right now, it should cause you to worship. And if it doesn't, that will tell you where your heart's at. Just saying. Uh, We prayed earlier about Israel, Palestine, and all the peace. and Or prayed for peace with all of the war just everywhere. Ukraine, Russia, all this stuff. Um, I've had several people asking me, because they always do, every time uh, Israel's in the news, is this the start of the end times? Is this the sign of end times? Um, I can't tell you that. Can't tell you that. Uh, I wouldn't tell you that. I remember 9-11. Some of y'all are old enough to remember that. I remember the feeling in my heart at that moment, it's indescribable, thinking that this is surely the beginning of the end. You know, this is it. This is the start of the end. Uh, I guarantee you Pearl Harbor felt that way for those who were alive at that time. And, it's, you know, Hitler, my goodness, you couldn't have a better argument for this is the end, particularly targeting Jews, calling himself God. I mean, uh, throughout history, there's been these moments. The one thing I can tell you is not when he's coming. I can tell you he is coming, but I can tell you he is seated on a throne. That, I can 100% tell you. How can you sleep at night with all this news and all this craziness going on? 
He's on the throne. That's how. How can you face persecution when people are attacking you or making fun of you or mocking you for what you believe because he is on the throne? I'm not believing in what I think. I'm believing in what I know. He's seated there. How can you face potentially being killed? There's Christians that face this around the world. Killed for what they believe. How can they do that? Because they know he's seated on the throne. So here's the one little point, like the road sign as we walk through this really quickly. And we're going to cover a chunk today, so you're going to need a Bible. But here's the road sign. Be encouraged, man. That sounds simple, but hold up now. Be encouraged. Because regardless of the headlines or what may come, there's a throne in heaven and all creation belongs. All creation belongs to the one who's seated on it all of it all right so that's not scripture that's me making a statement but hold that statement and see if you find it to be true when we read scripture look at revelation 4 that's where we're going to jump in we're going to read so you're going to need to look verse 1 after this john says i looked and behold there was a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which was jesus who'd spoken to him in chapter 1 which I'd heard speaking to me like a trumpet, you can go back and look, that was chapter 1, said, come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne. Now, was he physically there? Was he spiritually there? Yes. He was in a spiritual place, so he's not, whether he was a physical person or not is really irrelevant. He was in a place we would call heaven which is only accessible spiritually. So yes, he doesn't mean that he's a ghost. That's beside the point. Anyway, and behold, a throne. Remember what behold means? Behold means stop, hold up, hold up. Think about this now. Look at this now. That's what behold means. There's a throne. Eleven times in this one chapter it mentions throne. And it stood in heaven. And one was seated on it. One was seated on it. And he who sat there had the appearance of. Don't miss that phrase. What does have the appearance of me? It means I can't really describe what I'm seeing. So it kind of looked like whatever. This is very important because when you come to the book of Revelation, there's a lot of had the appearance of which we tend to, because we want to, cling to it and make it a fact. It is this because it says this. Well, not necessarily. He might be describing something in a way he doesn't know how to describe. For instance, does the gates and the road, the roads of heaven, are they paved with gold? It says they are. Do you think God needs gold? Do you think gold has some value to God? It's a rock. We make it valuable. So when he describes it as being of gold, it might be, but it's more about the fact that we consider that so valuable. So he's giving you some descriptive term so that you will see there's great value here. Okay, so he goes on, he says, the person on the throne had the appearance of jasper and carnelian stones, of precious stones, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of emerald. It was almost like a greenish tint rainbow here. Um, this is huge. If you know Revelation, if you know anything about end times, if you've watched any movie, any YouTube video, or you've heard anybody talk about it or preach about it or whatever else, you know that whether the details are there or not, the end times are supposed to be horrific, horrible, terrible, uh, destructive, the worst in human history. Whether you, whether you see that way or not, that's the way it's described. What's amazing here is that it starts with him on the throne. It starts with him on the throne, and it ends that way. In chapter 22, verse 1, he's on the throne, and we'll come back to that later in a couple of weeks. But this is going to be, for sure, the toughest time in the history of creation, and it begins with glory, with victory, with worship. Look what's going on here, you'll see, with praise, with celebration, and this rainbow, it says, around him. It's literally the Greek word halo. If you were to see a rainbow from the sky, it's a circle. It's not just a half. We can only see the half from where we are. But it's a, 
a bow. It's literally the word halo. So picture more the word a, a halo here than just an arch over the top of him. And it's a symbol of holiness. It's a symbol of the rainbow. It's a symbol of, regardless of what te- uh, modern day society tells you, it's a symbol of the covenant promise of life that was with Noah. And, and here's this picture of this one sitting there, verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on these thrones were 24 elders, and they were clothed with white garments and with golden crowns on their heads. Elders is a position, not an age. Don't think about rusty old men, you know, crumbled up in a little. That's not, an elder is a position, a title. You could say pastors. And if you say pastor, you might think different, so think different. It is 24 thrones and 24 statesmen. I mean, elder was a position sitting here on this throne, and they're in white garments, and they have crowns. Elders is a position of authority in a church or synagogue even, if you were looking Old Testament. Later, you're going to see the gates of heaven have 12 and 12 names on there, 24 names on it. So you have 12 And 12 here, totaling 24 thrones that go around. These guys on them have crowns. There's a couple of words for crowns in Greek. One is diadem. That would be what a king wears. The other is stephanos, which would be something you were awarded, like you ran a race. We don't hand out crowns now. We hand out trophies or badges or something. But a crown, stephanos crown, would be what they would give you like that, that you have won the race You finish the race. So these guys don't have diadems. These guys have Stephanos crowns. They have crowns that they've won a race. And they're sitting around and they're wearing white. So who are they? Well, there's a lot of debate about that. A lot of discussion. A lot of this book is debated and discussed. And I'll give you, after much research, and I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that to say just I'm qualified to answer. Whether whether you agree or not on a lot of these things, I have put in the work to give you a what I believe. Some things I'll fight you on, but there are many things I won't. It's okay. But I am convinced that these guys here are a picture of the 12 apostles and the 12 disciples. It just makes sense. 12, 12, 24. There were 12, 12, uh, 12 uh, uh, not apostles and disciples. Those are the same. Sorry. 12 tribes and 12 apostles. So the 12 tribes governed God's rule and work in the Old Testament. Uh, The 12 apostles governed God's church in the New Testament. And both of them represented together, that would be 24, God's kingdom. And when you get to the tribes and when you get to the gates of heaven, it's inscribed with those exact things. The 12 tribes, name of the 12 tribes and the name of the 12 apostles. You can go read it in your own time. So I think this is a picture of that. They founded Israel and the church. It's a picture of all saints in that. And they're seated on thrones, which symbolizes that they reign and govern God's kingdom uh, with him or under him, you could say. Look at verse 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder. I love this, man. The song you chose, my gosh. I was just in there singing it thinking, man, this is just the straight word of God. It's exactly described that. Peals of thunder. I love that word. Have you ever, if you've been in the south, you know for sure, but you don't have to be. Uh, It happens here some too. But that sound that it's almost like your hair stands up. You hear like this crack, 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 and it starts to rumble, and you're just waiting on the boom. You know, that's the idea of what's going on, that kind of rolling, tumble noise right before just a crash and then booming thunder, lightning flashing around. And before the throne, by the way, that's a clear picture of Mount Sinai as well. You can go back and look at Mount Sinai described the same way in Exodus 19. Before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. I think that is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And I'll come back to that in a minute, but just hold that for a minute. Verse 6, and before the throne... There was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. This is not an ocean. It is a pavement, but it's clear, big, open pavement around. Take a minute. Have you got the picture so far? Can't see it real well, can you? Can't see what he looks like necessarily. 
But maybe you've got a throne. Maybe you've got the halo. Maybe you've got the lightning, the thunder. Maybe you've got the glass under pavement underneath them. A sea of it, meaning it was huge. Around the throne, on each side of the throne, fully encircling it, are four living creatures. And they're full of eyes front and behind which means they see everything that they're given charge over. The first living creature is like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, the fourth living creature with the face of an eagle, or excuse me, like an eagle in flight. Fourth living creature, the four living creatures, excuse me, each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within and day and night, they never cease to say, eternally say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is and was and is to come. Now, we just went off the deep end, right? We just went in a Harry Potter novel, like, real fast. Like, I got it when it was, like, men sitting there on a throne. I got the, you know, the sea of glass, I got all that. But now what? You know? Now, again, I'm going to say we're not trying to dig deep, deep, deep into Revelation here. I, we can if you want, but that's not what we're doing today. Uh, but And I'll also say, people run crazy with all kinds of ideas about who these guys are, what they are, what all of the little details symbol mentioned here mean. But let me tell you this about Revelation. Uh, I got asked, challenged to preach Revelation years ago, or teach it. I didn't preach it, I taught it. It's a different thing. Um, and I studied it for five years before I even thought about it. I studied everybody's position on it. I read a ton on it. And then I taught it. And it took me over a year to get through the whole thing, an hour at a time. Uh, so I'm not saying that to brag. What I'm saying that to do is to press upon you the fact that I put the study in on it. And I can tell you this right now. Almost everything in Revelation is out of the first of this book. The Old Testament has the key to almost every page of Revelation. Almost every bit of it. So for John, seeing these guys, John wouldn't be doing like we're doing. John wouldn't be going, what in the world? This must mean Rome. This must mean, uh, you know, Ukraine. This must mean what? He wouldn't be thinking that. John would be thinking Scripture. You know why? Because Ezekiel talked about these guys. Ezekiel talked about them. In chap, we're not going to turn to it. In chapter 1, in chapter 10, you can look at them up. The cherubim, the highest angels. He described them, and he described them in very similar ways. He gave a little more detail about them, which is equally crazy. But the point I'm coming to is that he talked about them. This would be John saying, oh, these are the guys Ezekiel talked about. Uh, Isaiah talked about them. Called seraphim that describe the same kind of characters in Isaiah chapter 6. For John, he would be thinking, these are the guys that Ezekiel talked about in, you know, 400 AD, B.C. These are the guys that Isaiah saw in 800 B.C. And now here I am in nearly 100 A.D. seeing the same guys. It's the same God. It's the same throne. It's the same person that's the point. One notable thing I will say about their appearance is if you go back to the Old Testament again, the 12 tribes camped under four banners. They divided up and they camped under four banners. And you can look this up. Reuben was one. Dan was one. Ephraim was, was one. And Judah was one. Reuben's banner had a man. Dan's banner had an ox. Ephraim's banner had a calf or ox, or excuse me, Dan had an eagle, Ephraim had a calf or ox, and Judah had a guess what? Lion. It's almost like there's a connection there. All right? So, remember though, the point here is not about who's around the throne, the point is what? Who's on the throne? The point is about the worship that's going on here. Look at verse 9. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who's seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, also they fall down before him who's seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. Look at that. Ever and ever. Lives forever and ever. Eternity. They cast their crowns before the throne. What does that tell you? They're not mad. These belong to you. They're not even trying to be humble. They're literally saying, 
We're sitting here because of you. My throne means nothing apart from you. My crown is yours. My crown is you deserve the worship. Worthy are you, they say in verse 11, O Lord our God and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Because you created all things and by your will they were created. Note that salvation is not the subject of praise here. Creation is. They're celebrating creation. They're celebrating that this is the creator who's worthy of glory and honor and power forever. In the next chapter, we'll look at quickly in a second, but then he talks about redemption. Here it's the creator. He created creation. That makes him eternal, existing before it. Another word for that, omnipresent. He's everywhere because he created what exists including the time that it exists in. It says, by your will they were created, which means he's omnipotent, all-powerful. All-powerful. Because by his own will he created everything. Verse 1, chapter 5, roll on with me. Then I saw in his right hand, which is the symbol of power and authority, of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll, and written within on the back, and it was sealed with seven seals, which means it's completely and perfectly and totally sealed. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who's worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Now that seal on there would be a little wax seal. So think about a rolled scroll or flat scroll, and it has the edge going down, and somebody just drips wax seven times on it, and then the king, or whoever, in this case king, but whoever had the right to that scroll has a little ring on with a signet, and they'd push it into each of those wet wax spots, and it would make harden, and that's, that would be the seal. You don't break that seal unless you're that king or whoever that belongs to you. So the number seven, there, people go crazy with numbers, but there is some truth to numbers in the Bible. It is definitely a Hebrew thing. The number seven symbolizes perfection. It symbolizes completeness, and it's used throughout the Bible to do that. So that's not something weird or new. So you have this completely sealed, perfectly sealed document, and who is worthy to open it? What would make one worthy? We sung it in the song. Is he worthy? One man, the pinnacle of creation, on day six, Adam was given rule over all of creation. You go back and look at the first page of your Bible, Genesis 1, 27. He's created. He's given rule. He's put in charge. But instead, he sins. And sin enters the world, enters all of creation through this one man, Romans 5.12 says. Through his one sin, sin enters the world. Now, y'all don't have to believe in God if you don't want to. That's okay. You still believe in sin. You still believe in death. Now, I know because everything dies. Everything decays. Even these chairs, they're not alive. But if you set them out in that desert, they're going to decay at some point. Nothing, a tank left alone in the desert will decay. Everything that we know dies or is dying. Creation is dying and has been since then. But that curse of sin is what makes death come. Romans 3.10 and Romans 6.23 say that that death, that, that death is the result of that sin. So, man becomes slaves to sin. Man also becomes slaves to Satan. We looked at that weeks ago in Ephesians chapter 2, for instance, is one place where Satan is the one who deceives. So, Satan takes control of creation now. You may not feel like Satan's controlling you. He may not have to. You may be doing what he wants anyway. Not hating. I'm just saying. Satan becomes the ruler of the world. You think I'm wrong? I can give you a lot of reasons, but let's tell you what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, Paul said, In the case of those who are lost, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. That's after the cross and resurrection. Paul is still calling him the God of this world. John 16, verse 11, Jesus says, The ruler of this world is judged. Jesus himself is calling him the ruler of this world. Luke 4, verse 5, Satan himself, tempting Jesus, 
It says, he took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, to you I will give all the authority and glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Jesus did not correct him and say, no, you're mistaken. That was a true temptation that did belong to him. And he could do whatever he wanted to with it, just as it belonged to Adam, and he could do what he wanted with it. Look at verse 3. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one's found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. Because it's breaking his heart like there's not one, not one, not even an angel, not one, nobody who can take this scroll. I mean, only breakable by the king or somebody approved to do it. So what's on the scroll? What's the big deal about the scroll? Again, debate on this one. But as I say, Old Testament. I'm not going into it now. Isaiah 29 describes a scroll. Jeremiah 36 describes a scroll. Daniel 12 describes a a scroll. Ezekiel 2 describes a scroll. And now, once again, we have a scroll. Some say this is a will, like an inheritance. Some say it's a list of the judgments that are coming because when he breaks the seals, things start to go horrible on the earth. Some say it's a deed. The title of creation or or the earth. It was common in the Roman world. This is not weird to them. It was common in the Roman world to seal important documents with multiple seals. So this is not a strange thing to them that it was sealed like that. Deeds, marriage contracts, anything that required witnesses would be sealed that way And then there might be some notes written on the outside about what it is. And then the witnesses would typically sign the outside or the back if it was rolled over. So this is written on front and back as we read and sealed. And it's sealed multiple times to tell you it's it's one of these important documents. So I lean towards it being a deed or a title to creation. And I'll tell you why I feel that way. It's because of what's going on. Notice who's holding it. The one seated on the throne is holding it. It's his. It belongs to him. Satan has the right to rule the earth, but the title of creation still belongs to the creator. Nothing is beyond his sovereignty in this moment. But the earth is a mess. Who's worthy to do anything about it? Nobody can take the scroll. It belongs to him. But the earth is a mess. Rule was legally lost to the devil. It had to be legally regained. Satan was not worthy to take the scroll, but he didn't need to take the scroll because the earth is already a disaster. God's got to play by his own rules. And I'm not saying that funny. I'm being dead serious. If God said, you know, I know I said that, but let's not worry about it. He's a liar. That would be Satan's biggest goal. Make God a liar. So God, if God said the day you eat it, you're going to die, you must die. He can't not, he can't unsay what he said, and Satan knows that. So God's got to play by his own rules, which is the beauty of it all. That's why I love that you have a Bible, because if you were to look at Leviticus 25, you would see in verse 25 that God made a little clause in there called a kinsman redeemer. Whole book about that, Esther. But God made a little clause in there, and he said that in that little clause, I don't have the verse, you can look it up in your own time, the same law that gave Satan the opportunity to take it from Adam gives a family member the opportunity to buy back or redeem what was lost. But they must be wealthy, and they're going to have to buy it back. They have to pay the price. So what was the price to redeem? First of all, Jesus is a family member of Adam. He's born into the family through Eve. Um, excuse me, through Mary. His dad, though, is God, not Joseph, because he's sinless. So he didn't inherit the sin from his dad. But what was the price to redeem then? He's a family member. He's certainly wealthy. He's the creator of all things. What's the price? First Peter 1, 18. Knowing that you were ransomed, bought, paid for, from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. 
like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He paid for it with his life. His blood was the price. That's what the cross is about. Book of verse 5, Revelation 5, verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, don't cry anymore. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he's conquered and he can open the scrolls and his seven seals. Notice the lion is worthy because he already conquered. This is not who's going to go. He's already gone and come back. This is the beginning of him claiming what is his. He's not going to fight a battle here. He's going to take something that belongs to him. Lion of Judah comes from Genesis 49, Old Testament again. Look it up in your own time. It tells you that Judah is going to be the ruling tribe, and the Messiah would come from him. Root of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. So this is a picture and pointing to the fact that he will be royalty. He will be king. He will come from a royal family. And Jesse was tribe of Judah. It aligns straight up. John is surely now waiting. Remember, he's standing in front of the throne. Remember the scene? Surely he's waiting for the lion to come out and roar like, yeah, the lion of Judah, man. This is the moment, boy. Go get that scroll this year's. Look at verse 6. What does he see? The throne, before the throne and the four living creatures among the elders, I saw a lamb. Couldn't be a more opposite creature. Standing as though, again, as though it had been slain. It has visible mortal wounds, but it's standing. With seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on it. Only called the lamb in the Old Testament one time, Isaiah 53, one time. In the rest of the New Testament, he's called the lamb four times. In Revelation, he's called the lamb 31 times. In one book, you think that's the point here? Worthy in his death because he was slain, symbolized there. Worthy in his resurrection because he's standing there as though he were slain. And worthy in his victory because he is the lion of Judah pictured there. Seven horns, a horn, again, go to the Old Testament, multiple places, especially in Daniel. A horn is always associated with a king. Or power. And we know that because it tells you this horn is a king. It's a code breaker. Tells you. So when he sees him covered in horns, is he covered in kings? No. But he's the king of kings. And he's covered in power. And he's covered in authority. Seven, again, completeness. He is completely powerful. Omnipot- omnipotent. <laughs> uh omnipotent, huge, powerful, unbreakable. His eyes, seven eyes, means omniscient. He sees all. Nothing is hidden from him. Complete vision. Seven spirits again. One Holy Spirit, but he's the expression of all seven of God's spirits. You know, where are you getting that from? Isaiah, Old Testament, Isaiah 11.1 1 lists the seven spirits of God. It tells you knowledge, counsel, might, They're all in there. And it says that the root of Jesse will have them all because they all belong to him. And this is the root of Jesse standing there. The spirit was sent into all the earth. That happened in Pentecost. We've already read it. Look at verse 8. We're going to finish up. I know we covered a lot, but that's cool because you've got a Bible. You can go home and read it. Let's finish up here quick. Verse 8. And when he'd taken the scroll and the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb and they had harps and golden bowls full of incense. That's just like a, it looks like an upside down symbol on a drum kit. It was something that the, uh, they used in the temple to carry incense in and dump it on the incense fire. And it symbolized the prayers of God, the prayers of the people rising before God. So they're carrying those. They have harps for worship, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you. Lamb, to take the scroll and open his seals for or because you were slain and by your blood you purchased from slavery people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on earth. On earth. Why from every tribe and nation? 
We can say, well, God loves everybody. Yeah, but it's even better than that. Acts 17. We already looked at this before. We studied it. Acts 17, verse 26. Because he, God, made from one man every nation on mankind to live on all the earth, having determined their periods and their boundaries and their dwelling places. Why? So that they should seek him and perhaps feel their way and find him, and he's not far from each one of them. So before you think about the people in Gaza being the uh, filthy whoever they are, they're not far from God. Before you think about the filthy Israelites and who they are, they're not far from God. Lost, yes, but he's not far from them. Why? Because he made them. You don't like them, I'm sorry. He made them. From one man, he made them all. So, of course, his kingdom must be a kingdom of all. That's what he, the way he made it. It's the way he made it. Look at verse 11. Let's finish it now. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels now numbering myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, countless, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing, dot, 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 like everything they can think of. This God deserves it all. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, and all that's in them, I don't care if they're in hell, wherever they are, all of them saying to him who sits on the throne and the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That's what's being stated here. All worship who, though? Here? The lamb, the same way they were worshiping the one on the throne, they're worshiping the lamb. You could not have a clearer picture that Jesus is God. He is the one on the throne. Genesis 1.28 said all authority is given to Adam. Adam lost it. Genesis, or Luke 4.6, Satan said all authority is mine to give. And in Matthew 28.18, Jesus said all authority has been given to me. Now, last little piece. Look at verse 7, chapter 7. Skip over. And I just want you to see how it finishes. More people come to the throne from all tribes, people, and languages. And then the elders ask, John, who's this, who are these people? And it says there in verse 14, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They've washed it. So these are the ones that are dying throughout these times. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Again, the blood is for the cleansing. It's provided by the lamb. That's grace. They have washed them. That's faith. They are saved by grace through faith. The grace of the lamb to provide his blood, the faith of the one to wash themselves in it. And then it says, therefore, this is it. I'm finished, I promise. Because of that, therefore, they're before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. They're priests. They belong there. They live there. It's their home. And he who sits on the throne, you could put father right there. This is just me making sense of it. Father, he who sits on the throne will shelter or cover them with his presence. And they'll hunger no more, they'll thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. Man, that we can own that one living in the desert. Verse 17, for the lamb, you could put sun. The lamb in the midst of the throne, meaning standing on the throne, will be their shepherd. And he'll guide them to springs of living water. And God, you could put spirit here. And the reason why is because the spirit is called the comforter. And look what this will, God here will do. Wipe away every tear from their eyes. Father, Son, Spirit, one. They can say this only because he's on the throne. The lamb is worthy. He's the ruler of all creation, and he paid for them to be there in his blood, and they washed their robes in it by faith. Now, let me say this, and I'm going to close this up. Heaven is not just having a home. Heaven is not just not being sad anymore. 
Heaven is not just being without thirst. Heaven's not just being comforted and never having sorrow. It's having those things, but by nature of the one that you're with. The best part, listen to me, the best part of anything I've said today from his word, and we covered a lot, I know that. But out of everything I said from his word, the best part is that you're sheltered in his presence. Man, did you see that verse? Sheltered in his presence. Heaven is seeing God. It's the Father providing a home. It's the Son who's guiding and protecting us as a shepherd. It's the Spirit comforting us in all eternity. We're shepherded. We're comforted. We're loved. But that's because we're sheltered in His presence. Man, that's awesome. If you're not looking for Him, you're going to be disappointed when you get where you go. I'm just saying. If you're looking for Him, you won't care if there's streets of gold. It won't matter to you. So be encouraged. Regardless of the headlines or what may come, there's a throne in heaven and all of creation belongs to him who's seated on it. You guys stand up with me and I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite them to come back up. And we're going to do one more song. And then, uh, man, we'll move to a time of baptism. I'm pretty pumped about that. But let me... uh, Let me move the table. Let me pray for us really quickly. Um, Lord, man, thank you for being on the throne. Thank you that I don't have to worry about so many things I could be worried about. Thank you. Lord, I don't know whose life belongs to you in this room and whose doesn't. But what I do know is that we were all created by you and we must all return to you must all face you, must all stand accountable before you. But that's a great thing if we know you. And I pray today, God, that there be people in this room, if they don't know you, that today they tell you who they are and they recognize who you are. Nobody has to tell me I'm a sinner. Nobody has to tell me this world is full of sin because I do it every day and I hate it. I live in it. I struggle with it. I battle with it. What hope do I have? I have no hope apart from what you did. No one is worthy except you. And your blood has made me worthy. Because by faith, I've washed my soul in it. Lord, I pray that people would do that today. Just cry out to you, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, I believe in you. I trust you. I don't have the answers. I can't explain it all. I don't know what it's all about, but I trust that it's true and I need you. I'm tired of doing it myself. I'm tired of fighting it. I know who I am, and I need you. They can say it, say it however you want, man. I don't, it's your words, not mine. You tell them. And then share it with us. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for those who are here today. And we celebrate you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.